run for governor. He has, he was the attorney for the Abundies. He's also sued the Utah governor. I would like to introduce Morgan Philpott. <laughs> How many of you have never heard me speak before? How many of you have no idea who I am? Okay. I'll give you a little bit of backdrop and I'll try to make it brief. Um, I wanted to start very differently, but I figured I better give a little bit of an introduction. I was going to start by saying, abandon all hope ye who enter here. <laughs> but that's not a really good way to sell myself, is it? Closer? Is that better? Yeah. Okay, I'll step back here so that hopefully that'll work out. Um, I am 49 years old, and I feel pretty good about that. But the reason I tell you that is approximately 24 years ago, I decided to take my career in the direction of politics. Now, the reason I did that is because I was an anthropology and environmental studies major at the University of Utah. So, go to, I'm repenting of that. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> so, I decided to kind of change, but to accomplish that, I didn't want to reset my entire studies, and so I signed up for an internship in Washington, D.C., and I got it. I became an intern at the White House under Clinton and Gore. And Sorry. See, it just keeps getting worse, doesn't it? Yeah. And it was, you know, I was a young, naive LDS kid, and if I tried to swear, I sounded really dorky. <laughs> so I walk into the chairwoman's office at the Council on Environmental Equality. Her name is Katie McGinty. And if you don't recognize her name, she and Carol Browner were the two staffers who had come with Al Gore out of his Senate seat in Tennessee. And they became the epicenter of modern environmentalism. Almost everything you know today as it came through the channels of government, went through that office. So I walk in and here's Katie McGinty and she's on the phone and she starts dropping the F-bomb over and over and over. And I was like, oh my, you know, that lady's got a mouth on her. <laughs> and she's talking to the vice president. Oh. And I look at the person next to me and I'm like, she should not be talking to the vice president that way. And they're like, uh, you're kind of an idiot. <laughs> that's how he talks and I was like oh and it was really disillusioning for me because I'm this young naive LDS kid and I'm thinking people don't talk that way in the White House well it turns out everybody talks that way in the White House so that was kind of disappointing I know that's kind of a silly thing maybe but I went home early really disillusioned and I went home for some knee issues and I decided at that time to go get active in the Republican Party of Utah. And my wife and I went to our local caucus meeting and we became everything because we were the only two people there. <laughs> and then I graduated. And you know what you do with an anthropology degree? You sell cars. <laughs> That's what I did. And you know what you do when you're a car salesman? You run for office. <laughs> Now, that's what I did, and I won. And at the age of 28, I took office as a Utah State Legislator. And I spent four years there until I had my first son, and then I thought, you know, this is no way to try and make a living because you can't make a living as a local politician. Thank goodness, until now, maybe, in circuitous ways. And so I took off to go to law school. I left one secret combination to join another. <laughs> and I spent time in Michigan at a little podunk law school, fourth tier, nothing special, but I got to learn from people like Judge Bork. He was one of our professors. Charlie Rice, who's a Catholic legal scholar. Uh, Howard Romberg, fantastic property professor. And 
and Ju Justice Scalia was on our board. And Justice Scalia, this was my, you know, I, I've had these moments of just total disillusionment in politics. You know where you have these dreams and they're shattered completely? And then you build them back up and they're shattered again? This is one of those moments. Because here's Justice Scalia, right? He's the originalist on the court. And I raise my hand and there's this guy, I really want to ask this question. And he points at me and says, yeah. And this guy in front of me starts talking and Justice Scalia goes, not you, not you, be quiet. Him. <laughs> Sweet. I can ask my question, sucker, you know, that poor guy standing in front of me. And I say, hey, look, I'm a former state legislator. And I saw a lot of federalism that really intruded on state sovereignty. At what point in time do you think it's okay for a state legislature, for example, to engage in a little bit of civil disobedience against the federal government? Love it. <laughs> I, I did too. His answer was so disappointing. He said, never. He said, I'm a federally. I've always been a federally. I always will be a federally. And I thought, that's the originalist on the court. If that's the way he thinks, we're in trouble. So I tried to kind of forget that moment. I went back home. I got active in politics again. I ran for vice chair of the Republican Party of Utah, and I won. Now, that would be the last time I would ever win anything again. <laughs> now, normally, we're raised to think that when you lose, you're a loser. I'm a loser, okay? I'm okay with that. I've, I've come to grips with that. But you know what's valuable about losing? You have to ask yourself something that winners don't. Now, normally, I'd be okay not ever asking myself that question if I was like running a race, because it'd be like, why didn't I win? I, he was faster than me. Um, why did I lose the basketball game? They scored more points. In politics, it's not quite like that, right? Because in politics, it's all you people voting for me or the other guy. So when you don't get the votes, you look at yourself and you say, what did I do wrong? What could I do differently so that I could win? And what was interesting is, I was a little bit shocked by the answer. Because, you know, when you win in politics, there are really important lessons you never learn. Because you always think you did it right. And that gets you what we have. And how's that going for us? Terrible. Terrible. It's horrific. So after a series of losses, I said, I'm just going to go be a lawyer. And I got a phone call from Ryan Bundy. And he said, hey, will you come and help me? And he couldn't, he couldn't afford it. And I wanted to help him, but he was wanting me to come defend him in an entirely different state. So he said, well, I'm gonna try and get my brother to call you guys, because he's been able to raise some funds. So I ended up going and becoming the attorney for Ammon Bundy in Oregon at the Malheur occupation trials with Marcus Mumford and a guy named Rick Kerber, who was our paralegal. Uh, Marcus at the, well, you probably know what happened in that trial. The Bundys won, it was incredible, it was a miracle. And uh, kudos to them for having the courage Amen. to stand up and never give up and risk literally the rest of their entire lives to do that. Uh, at the end of that trial, my partner, Marcus Mumford, who was the best trial attorney I have ever known in my life, that I've ever seen in my life, was um, standing about where you know, this gentleman was right here. <laughs> You can imagine yourself sitting in a courtroom, and up here is the, the I may say this funny, we call it the, the dais, where the judge sits, and that's the bench, okay? And right in front of the judge is called the well. And then the attorneys sit at the bench 
uh, for the attorneys. And then behind the attorneys is the bar. And so you have to pass the bar to get across that bar. And then behind the attorneys is the gallery or the audience. Now for an attorney to step into the well, which is the little space between him and the judge, is a no-no. You have to get permission from the judge to do that. Well, Marcus was right there. He did not come into the well. And for some reason, all the marshals tackled him, tased him, and arrested him after we won. Yeah. Now, they said that he was bearing down and about ready to rush the judge. <laughs> but we won. <laughs> right? So how many lawyers do you see win miraculous victories and decide to go beat up the judge? <laughs> well, I'm standing literally right next to him like this going, what should I do? Should I jump in there? <laughs> oh crap, that's a taser. Oh gee, they just tased him. Oh, they tased him again. That's like my, in slow motion, I'm like thinking, you know, because normally as a guy, what are you supposed to do when your buddy is getting beat up? Help him out. <laughs> Help him out. But my mind is going, like envisioning the whole thing. I jump in, I get tased, they shoot me. My five kids mourn my loss. I think I'll just let him get tased. <laughs> and what's funny is, if you ever knew Marcus, Marcus has passed on um, of natural causes, supposedly. And Marcus had a stutter. And Marcus hated and loved his stutter. Because in court, imagine how a stutter works. You know, you got a judge who's like, that guy better shut up right now. But you can't say that. So he'd pull out the stutter whenever he wanted the judge to be quiet. <laughs> and all I could think of after that was creating a shirt with Marcus's face on it that said, don't tase me, bu -bu 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 bro. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish to this day I'd done it because I can't think of a better way to honor him because he was, he was awesome. He was also incredibly annoying, don't get me wrong, he wasn't perfect, but he was an awesome trial attorney. Well, it turns out that the marshals who tackled him and tased him were missing something really, really important. Any guesses as to what it might be? Ammon Bundy is now innocent. Guess what happens to Ammon Bundy? He gets to walk out that door. You think they were gonna let Ammon Bundy go? No, because they were going to take him to Las Vegas, Nevada for his second trial for the Bunkerville standoff. So Marcus had stood up to say, where's the papers? Where's your transport order? Guess who didn't have a transport order? The U.S. Marshals. Guess who tackled him? The U.S. Marshals. Guess who couldn't produce the order for us after they tackled him? The U.S. Marshals. So they charged him with a federal crime. Oh. Yeah, the same crime they charged Ammon Bundy with, interfering with a federal officer. Now, what's funny is when you go back and watch the video, and it's online to this day, you'll see Marcus Mumford doing nothing wrong. Well, Marcus, through his attorney, subpoenaed the text records of all those U.S. Marshals, yes. and guess what they did? Drop the case like that. Because they were horrible to Ammon. And they were, were very rude to all the attorneys. Because they thought for sure. What's that? They were out to get you. Yeah, they, they were. And they knew they were going to win. Because they were in Portland, Oregon, in front of the most liberal jury you could get, and they lost <laughs> unanimously. Yeah. So they then transport Ammon down to Nevada. And Rick and I went down to Nevada to defend Ammon. And while we're in, and I'm just giving you a couple examples. While we're in Nevada, my paralegal is about to walk into the federal building one day. 
And one of the, I can't remember if it was another attorney, I think it was, came running out and said, tell him to turn around and go away. I said, why? And they said, something's going on. The U.S. Marshals are here and they're watching for him. And I thought, well, that's kind of odd. So I ran out, I, I got on the phone real quick with Rick and I said, hey, hold off, I'll be out in a second. Something's going on and we think it has to do with you. Well, it turns out that the U.S. Marshals had called around the United States looking for anything on Rick they could find. And they found an unpaid parking ticket oh, in Wendover, Nevada. Oh, so they actually called Wendover, Nevada and asked the little clerk at the little town to issue a warrant for his arrest. And they stood ready to arrest our paralegal in Nevada. Well, that would be just the beginning of the things that we learned. In that second case, we found information that we weren't allowed to have in Oregon. And if we had had it in Oregon, boy, the things we could have proved then. But we weren't even allowed to talk about Nevada in that Oregon trial. And what's interesting about that is when you go back to the Oregon or the Nevada trial, how many of you remember that standoff in Buckerville? How many of you remember the government saying that the Bundys had called out the militia and lied about what the government was doing? Guess who was helping stoke the fire to get people to come out? The government. Do you know where the two epicenters of domestic terrorism are in the United States? where they control domestic terrorism operations from? Washington and Colorado. Why would you do that? Guess where the focus of their efforts was at that time? The Rocky Mountain West. Because of all the domestic terrorists in the Rocky Mountain West. <laughs> right? So now ask yourself, what in the world's going on? And that's what we started wondering. Well, it turns out that the Bundys have been saying things like, hey, there are cameras up outside of our house. There are red lasers being pointed at us. There are snipers up on the hills. We keep seeing military style people around the farm. And the government came out and said, the Bundys made that up. In fact, if you look at the indictment, one of the charges talks about how they lied about seeing snipers and being surveilled. Well, guess what we proved? They were being surveilled. There were cameras planted around their house. There was an FBI post stationed a half a mile from their house. Uh, Davey Bundy was one of the first ones to take his iPad and film two guys up on a hill who were kind of poking their heads over the hill, and he was trying to get evidence of these snipers. Well, the government said that he was lying. They were just law enforcement officers until later, um, Dan Hill, who did something beyond brilliant, he was Andy's other attorney out in Nevada, he called the local uh, shredder and he said, hey, do you remember when the government was out here? And I said, yeah. He said, did you do any shredding for them by chance? <laughs> Guess what they said? Yes. Yeah. We have like eight bags of shredded documents here. You want them? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and Daniel went, yes, I do. And Carol Bundy went and got those and guarded those with her life. Well, What's interesting is we thought we might find all this good stuff in there, but it turns out that there were just words like militia, drudge report, newsmax. Those are bad words now, right? When you get caught with those words on you, you might be a domestic terrorist under the Biden administration. If I say that, I might be convicted of hate speech now. I, I don't know. And um, so, we asked for an evidentiary hearing 
and we throw these things out there and the government produces their own investigator to investigate whether or not they did anything wrong. <laughs> That's how it works. And guess what he got up and said? We didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And the judge fortunately kind of said, hold on a second. If you're shredding documents, clearly you've got a place where you've got a shredder. Where is that place? And it turned out it was a trailer. So we said, hey, we'd like to talk to the gal who was operating that trailer. So we brought her in after this other guy had said, hey, we didn't do anything wrong. And we started to question her and she said, well, yeah, I was sitting in front of a big TV screen. Oh, really? What, what was on that TV screen? Oh, well, a news feed of, you know, different operations. Really? Did you keep those recorded anywhere? Yeah, I'm pretty sure we did. And the judge kind of looked at the government and said, hey, I thought you didn't have anything like that going on. She said, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was being fed to the other trailer. And the judge is like, the other trailer? And we said, we want to interview those people too. Well, it turned out the FBI was there. And it turned out that they had a little thumb drive. The FBI did. And they had forgotten that they had put the thumb drive in the glove compartment of one of the vehicles used in the operation. They just forgot that. Oh, and by the way, that thumb drive had the logs of the sniper team deployments and the surveillance crews and the helicopter dispatches and the names of all the agents. But it was just an accident that the FBI had placed that little thumb drive in the glove compartment of one of their vehicles. Now that was just the beginning. We found out that they were training attack dogs how to attack protesters before there were protesters. Now why would you do that? We found out that the United States attorneys themselves had been on site before anything ever happened because they were entrapping them. It was all a setup. Why would you do that? Those are the questions rolling around in our head. Well, you gotta justify budgets, right? And if you're gonna literally build an army in the Rocky Mountains with snipers in the Forest Service, snipers in the National Park Service, snipers in the BLM, fully automatic weapons, military trained officers, Bearcats and Apache helicopters, what do you need to do? You better find some terrorists real quick. <laughs> and they did, right? They turned the Rocky Mountain West into the seabed of domestic terrorism. You and I know that's garbage, but that's our government. And it's really, disheart it's really disheartening when you see that and you prove without a doubt to a judge appointed by Harry Reid and Barack Obama. She found them guilty of outrageous misconduct. So not only did we prove that the government was engaged in a conspiracy, but a liberal judge agreed with us and dismissed the case with prejudice. And for a second time, the Bundys miraculously walked free. You know how many years they faced in prison between those two? Yes. Life? More. 420 years. That's how much time they were facing. They didn't kill anyone. They didn't rape anyone. They didn't steal anything. Right? Welcome to the United States of America. Now, I've already been a state legislator by this time. Now I get to be a lawyer, and I get to see that. Because of that, about eight mothers came to me last year when COVID-19 happened and said, hey, will you sue the government for us? Because they're putting masks on our kids. And I said, no, you're gonna lose. Well, what do you mean we're gonna lose? It's wrong. I said, I know. What does that have to do with anything? 
When is that stopping? You really think you're gonna get masks off your kids at schools? And they said, yeah, sure, why not? I said, okay, let me entertain you for a second. Let's have a little bit of a conversation here. You really think that COVID-19, which is going on all over the world, right? And the response is the same all over the world. You really think that you're going to sue the state of Utah and you're going to win? Uh. Right? Does that make sense to you? Now, let me ask you in a way that you might put it from a little bit of a different perspective. As a legislator, I learned about something called a model law. Anybody know what a model law is? Or what are they? Give me an example. When a, when a group comes to the state legislature, they already have the law drafted, yep. they're presented to them, they pass it. Yeah. So, Uniform Commercial Code. Have you ever heard of the UCC? How many of you have ever been involved in a divorce? Or an adoption? All those laws come from model laws. Now, how many of you have ever heard of a, a no-fault divorce? How about a fault divorce? You know what a fault divorce is? We don't have them anymore. We used to have them until we passed model laws across the entire United States. So for example, if your husband was out shacking up with somebody else, guess whose fault the divorce was? His. And you could put that in the papers and say, hey judge, it was his fault. But now we call it irreconcilable differences. Now you can imagine that some states across America are a little more Catholic. Some might be a little bit more LDS. Some might be like a place that would elect Bernie Sanders. <laughs> and they might take that real quick. But the Latter-day Saint people in Utah didn't really like no-fault divorces. We actually maintain one ground for fault in divorce, and it means nothing anymore. And it's for adultery. But how long do you think it would take to get a model law like that passed across the entire United States? Give me a guess. A long time. Oh, 50 years. So to get a model law in, the more controversial it is, the longer you have to lobby all those different states to pass it into law. How long do you think it would take to get the world to adopt a model law on COVID-19? <laughs> it's impossible. It doesn't happen. As a legislator and as a lawyer, I recognize when COVID-19 happened, something was wrong. Because it doesn't happen. And it definitely doesn't happen in two months. And when a model law passes, you can't go to Wikipedia and go into the edit history of Wikipedia. You ever been compulsive enough to go do that? <laughs> I have. And when COVID-19 hit, I went to Wikipedia to learn about epidemiology and contact tracing. And when I went to contact tracing, I couldn't find my answer because guess what was in Wikipedia on COVID-19 and contact tracing? Oh well, yeah, it's normal. It's normal to do contact tracing with COVID-19. And I went, hey, this is not right because I'm looking at these other virus outbreaks right. and people are dying with those to the tune of like 9% of the people who get them. And I said, something's wrong here. And I went, you know what? I bet if I went to the edit history of Wikipedia, I could find out when they put COVID-19 in there. So I did it and I went through it all. All of it, all of it, all of it, point by point, till I found the day when they put COVID-19 in. And it was after COVID-19 happened, of course, and it was put in by some random editor. And if you've ever studied on the history of Wikipedia users, the guys who go in and fact check everything, they have like histories. I've been on here for this long, and I've done this, and I specialize in this area. Guess what was on the description of the two guys that were putting COVID-19 in? Nothing. Brand new users, never put anything on before, and all of a sudden here comes COVID-19 as part of contact tracing. Somebody then boots it out. 
because it doesn't meet the standards. They come in and put it back in that stays forever. And all of a sudden history is revised and COVID-19 is the type of thing you do contact tracing for. And that starts to spread in everything you know. And it becomes a part of everyday life. And so I'm looking at these eight mothers sitting before me thinking they're in for a rude awakening. They're about to realize something that took me 20 years to learn. Right? That is, the system is corrupt. And it's hard to say that because most people have not been able to sit through what I sat through in life. Right? They don't get to see the FBI lie on the stage. They don't get to see the evidence of how they killed a man in Oregon, mm -hmm. LaVoy Finnecum. Mm -hmm. right, when we studied that, I actually went to ask to read his trial. He's the FBI HRT hostage rescue team member who was accused of having taken a shot. Well, have you heard the name Wooten? Larry Wooten was one of the lead investigators for the Interior Department to try and find out if they had conducted the Bundy operations ethically. And Wooten came out and said, hey, they're not. There's something wrong here. Guess what they did to Wooten? Kicked him out. Took him off the case immediately. Took away all his stuff, computers, files, everything. So later, while we're in the Nevada trial, he goes to the Justice Department as a whistleblower and says, hey, this is what's going on. It's corrupt as can be. We didn't even get to present that. We had won before that even made the evidence. Driving Ryan Payne's in the passenger seat. All of a sudden, cars pull up behind him with some lights. LaVoy stops. Ryan Payne rolls down his window. Puts his hands on the window sill. And they shoot at him. Right then and there. Now that was admitted to in the Astorita trial. So LaVoy says, I'm out of here. And he yells out the window, I'm going over to the sheriff. You can talk to me there. And he leaves. Now, as he comes down the road, he gets out of cell service and he approaches a blind corner. And around that blind corner, what he doesn't know is that the FBI and the Oregon State Police have set up what's called a dead man's roadblock. And when he comes around the corner, he sees it. And guess what happens? They shoot at him again. He starts to slam on the brakes in the middle of winter, plows off into the snow to avoid hitting the, car, the cars, and jumps out of his vehicle with his hands up and they shoot him dead. In the Astorita trial, it comes out that the two men who shoot him actually get on the government's walkie-talkies and one of them who was up there where they shot at him first, CBs down to the other and says, we're gonna have to kill him. Jumps in his car, follows LaVoy down, and with the guy that he said that to, shoots him and kills him. Now tell me that's an accident, that that's not planned. That's murder. The judge promised us we could go to trial and then found all of the federal actors immune completely from anything. And so we're not even sure we're gonna get a trial in that case now, because she's just taken them all out. Now, back to modern day, here I am last year, COVID-19 hits the world, and you know what I'm thinking? This doesn't look good, because I know some things. I've been around the block a little bit, and this doesn't look good. And so I've got these mothers, and I tell them, it won't work. You'll lose. But they're awesome. And they sit with me for a long period of time, and we talk about how to organize and what to do, and how to do things, and how to look for victory in different ways. And they go out and start organizing events like this everywhere they can. And they start trying to get people to mobilize. And so I filed a lawsuit for him. And we got mocked for that lawsuit because we quoted the Book of Mormon, the Bible, the Constitution, and people like John Locke. Now you'd think that when you go to court, the one thing that everybody would want to talk about is the Constitution, right? No, judges don't like constitutional issues. 
Now, we heard through the grapevine that we were going to win. The, and, and I knew we would. Any honest person who looked at our lawsuit was going to know that their actions were illegal. And we had heard through legislators and other attorneys that the governor's office knew we were gonna win. So you know what they did? They filed an answer to our lawsuit, and in it they said, ah, you should dismiss this because it's all going to be moot anyway. Mm. Now what does moot mean? It'll be irrelevant. And sure enough, guess what they did? They took all the emergency, threw it in the garbage, repackaged it and called it a public health emergency and did it through a administrative body instead of elected officials. Guess what that did to our complaint? Made it moot, exactly like they said it would be. We thought maybe we were special, that they were doing that just for us. But a couple of our friends actually researched across the United States of America and one third of all the states had a similar response and did the same thing. Now tell me that's not planned. So how are you gonna sue the government in a moment like this, right? Now to make matters worse, go to the state courts and the federal courts and read their orders about COVID-19. Guess what they say? They support the exact same narrative. And those orders are being issued by judges. So how do you think your case is gonna do when you set it in front of those judges? And you say, the emperor has no clothes on. And their orders say, the emperor has clothes on. It's DOA. See, your lawsuit's not gonna beat a worldwide conspiracy of corrupt politicians. So the question becomes, what do you do, right? What do you do? Which is why I'm tempted to stand in front of people and say, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. <laughs> this doesn't sell very well. Nobody invites me back when I say that. <laughs> so what do you do? Well, there is an answer. There is something to do. But you have to rewire your brain a little bit. And you have to kind of have your notions destroyed before you can build them back up right again. It's called rebirth, right? You got to have your brain a little bit reborn. Now, the problem with what you face is you've gotten used to expecting things that you don't have anymore. Things you call your rights, they're gone, okay? I sat in a room with somebody who said, but Morgan, my friend just got arrested over at the school board meeting because he was standing in front of the door and all he was doing was listening and when the cop went to pull the door closed, he was in front of it. And they called that obstruction, said he was interfering, and they arrested him because he was standing there hoping they'd let people in without masks on to go to the open public meeting, which is illegal to close. And he said, so that was a violation. And I said, no, it wasn't. No, come on, surely it was. No, it wasn't. When a police officer tells you to do something, you do it. If you're right and he's wrong, guess what the courts say? You do it. And then after he beats you down, you can go to the court and say he was wrong and they will say he's wrong. Your rights don't come first anymore, right? Now there's also a reason for that because you got a lot of police officers who have faced areas like Minnesota with BLM protesters who are trying to kill them and throwing Molotov cocktails. So what do you do, right? What do you do? I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you can say that, I can't. The FBI probably still taps my phone to this day. <laughs> By the way, after, after we won in Oregon and Nevada, the government went after Marcus's license in Oregon and Nevada 
and to this day they still have open complaints against me through the United States Justice Department in Oregon and Nevada. Now to make it more rich, the people who filed the complaint against me in Oregon and Nevada, it's the department within the United States Justice Department that's supposed to go after attorneys within the United States Attorney's Office who have committed, guess what kind of conduct? Outrageous, right, and inappropriate conduct like the attorneys in the Bundy case. Guess who didn't get a complaint? Them. They're not supposed to go after guys like me, but they did come after me. And that's again our government. So I gotta be careful. In fact, we had in almost every meeting, every meeting we went to, even if it was sitting down in the cafeteria during court, there were always informants around us, always. We actually had one of them in the Nevada trial go down into the cafeteria and take a picture of one of the jurors and publish it online, which if I did, I'd get kicked out and disbarred. We brought this to the attention of the marshals and they sat her next to them through the rest of the trial. She got to actually stay in the courtroom. So again, what do you do, right? What do you do? And I had a question earlier about just activism. What about trying to influence your local county government? What about trying to sponsor a bill in the legislature? Well, let me ask you a question. How many of your legislators do you think right now are up on the hill doing something about what happened last year? Uh, they are, but it's uninspiring. It's things like, hey, we need to kind of tweak the emergency powers of the governor a little bit. No, you need to get rid of them. When you abuse them like that, there must be a consequence. And the consequence is you lose that power altogether. But we don't have the moral fortitude to demand that anymore. There is no consequence for wrongdoing as a legislator. None. Right? Name one single politician who bared any consequence whatsoever for what happened last year. And you know why that happens? I have bad news for you. It's our fault. You know why it's our fault? Because we created this problem. And you know how we did it? We did it one public school and one park at a time. Because if you can create a park and ask all your neighbors to pay for the park, right? then why can't you make other moral judgments about what your neighbors can and can't do? If you have to pay for my kid's education, because it's for the public good, what can't you do? All you have to do is assign some moral superiority to your piece of legislation and say it's good for the public and you can get away with anything. So we've justified this for generations. How many of you have ever heard of Ayn Rand, that horrible libertarian monster? Right? I love Ayn Rand actually. I actually think she's one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. <laughs> she says she was an atheist. I don't believe her. I think she didn't want to help lazy Christians. Ayn Rand wrote an essay called the Compra Chicos. Anybody speak Spanish? Compra means buy, Chicos means children. It was an essay about the child buyers of the 17th century. And they would go to families and they would buy their children voluntarily. Families would sell them for money. And then they would take those poor little kids and they would deform their bodies and they would sell them to circuses. Well, fortunately that doesn't happen anymore, or does it? Right? Now, here's what happens. You can do anything you want to our kids. So long as it's the government that's doing it. Until you put a physical manifestation of what you're doing. And the moment you put a physical manifestation on our kids, everybody throws a fit. Because we don't want our kids coming home wearing a mask that makes us think about the mental, emotional, social, and cultural abuse that is happening to them at those damn government indoctrination centers. Yeah. How do you think we got to where we are? 
You think turning your kids over to the government to get an education didn't put you right here in this spot? How do you think those socialists were made? On your money. With the National Education Association, the Utah Education Association. When I was a legislator, the president of the UEA walked next to me and said, parents have no business telling us how to educate their children. That was 21 years ago. You know what's happened since then? Welcome to the Biden administration. Right? It's on us. How do you think Gary Herbert got into office and sold us down the river? Do you know how much money he took from the federal government? Any guesses? $105 billion. Do you know who our nearest competition was? California. How much? $44 billion. Now ask yourself, why is Utah taking $105 billion when, you, when California is taking forty-four? You know where that money went? Anyone know? To an industrial bank for health savings accounts. We have no idea where it went. We literally laundered $105 billion in Utah. We're not just one of the offenders, guys. We're the worst offender. Our own good conservative Republican LDS Governor Herbert. Okay? That's Utah. And until we start to wake up to those things and own them, we're just going to keep making the same mistakes. You know what's got to happen? Consequence. There must be consequence. If there's no consequence, they'll just keep doing it. So I propose a consequence, okay? If you're guilty of one single offense from now on, just one, neither you nor your children for seven generations get to ever hold office in the state of Utah again. Yeah, oh, I agree. There's a consequence. How quickly do you think they'd clean up their act? We'll ship them back to the state they came from, like Mitt Romney. Mitt <laughs> 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 Romney. He's out of our state. Yeah, well, how does it happen? But do you see, you see how that works? It's a little bit like Plato's cave. Anybody ever heard of Plato's cave? In Plato's cave, what's happening to the people way down at the bottom? Do you remember? Yeah, so uh, they're only seeing shadows. Why can they only see shadows? They're down at the bottom of the cave, right? There's a light that can, will come through at the top, at the mouth of the cave, but they live way down at the bottom and they're tied to posts, right? And they can only see one direction. They're in bondage. And so when somebody above them holds up a book and they see the shadow of a book, what do they learn to call it? A book. Is it a book? No. It's the shadow of a book. They see dancing. Is it dancing? No, it's the shadow of dancing. And they begin to think that the shadows that they see on the wall are real. That the shadow dancing is real dancing. That the shadow book is a real book. And one day somebody comes down into the cave and unties one and brings him out up into the light. And guess what he does? He runs back in because he's so disoriented by this foreign light and this freedom. He doesn't even know what freedom is. He thinks that the shadow is freedom. That's us. We're the people in the cave. And we've forgotten how to have liberty. See, because we have people who run around and say, hey, what about my inalienable rights? What about them? Your parents and grandparents sold them generations ago. What do you mean your rights? Right? How many of you have ever needed an attorney in your life? And why? Since when did we decide 
We needed attorneys to stand between us and our rights in court. How many of you have ever had to deal with a prosecutor? You know, we didn't used to have prosecutors. All the prosecutors in America are now hired by the government. You know how often they lose? <laughs> they, they rarely lose. So when you get a case like the Bundys, when they're absolutely innocent, the chances of them being found innocent are God comes down himself and delivers them through a miracle. That's not how it's supposed to be. But that's the state we're in. We don't know how to teach our kids anymore. We don't know how to own homes without mortgages. Instead, we have that horribly corrupt mortgage banking industry that puts us into bondage for 30 years. And we teach our kids that it's normal. We send our kids to high schools where if you're not cool, you get beat up and picked on and we call it a rite of passage. And then if you're lucky, you can go to that goddamn Harvard, right? Or maybe if you're lucky, you can go to Yale and join the Skull and Bone Society and become part of the worst secret combination in the history of America. We are messed up and we don't even see it. And so we keep electing these pansy, horrible legislators and we say, but they're nice. They're nice. Because Latter-day Saint people today worship the gospel of nice. <laughs> right? <laughs> but, now, I'm LDS, guys. I normally don't swear. I apologize for the sensitive ears. Sometimes I just can't help it today. <laughs> I'm so upset sometimes. It's why I've kind of decided to actually distance myself from politics. Because I've tried for, God, what has it been now? 24 years, 24 years I've tried. And the reality is the world doesn't want people like us in politics. And so what do you do, honestly? You know, really, what do you do? And that's really why I wanted to come and talk to you tonight, because I want to talk about what are your rights? Should you be suing the government? Now, in asking you that question, I already have a, I already have a belief. You should never sue the government unless you want to do something other than win. Right? Because you're probably not going to win. But if you can create alternative strategies for why you do things, you might be able to find an avenue where you can obtain some victories and begin to draw people into organizations you create. Now that's one of the things I taught the plaintiffs. I don't know if I really taught it to them. I think everybody kind of knows this internally. And that is how do you recreate government when it must be recreated? And we've even lost that history with horrible things like, what was that? project, 1619 project or something like that. And what's the critical race theory is the latest common core before that. Right, it was Governor Herbert who signed common core into place. We reelected him. We knew then what he was going to do. Do you know that Governor Herbert, do you know that Governor Herbert is also the one? Well, he was the governor who signed an agreement with the Rockefeller Foundation last year. He signed an agreement without any legislative oversight, no accountability, no transparency with the Rockefeller Foundation, who was the one running COVID-19 test runs back in 2010 and 11. Okay. You'll find that online. On, you can watch their, their exercises on YouTube if they haven't scrubbed them. Okay, so he gets into bed with them and agrees to spend our money guaranteeing that we, the state of Utah, will buy 500,000 rapid antigen tests. Now you know why they're testing everybody? Because <clears throat> our politicians agreed with a little secret combination and another secret combination to buy 500,000 tests. Now where's that 105 billion going? Then, when you want to ask these questions, they start the legislative session by putting military personnel around and telling you you can't come. Welcome to 
to modern America. So, again, what do you do? Well, it's very simple. It's actually really, really simple. How many of you have uh, ever read Gordon Wood's book, The Radicalism of the American Revolution? He won a Nobel Prize for it. Brilliant author. And in it, he demonstrates that the American founding fathers and their predecessors were some of the freest, wealthiest people in the entire world. So why are they rebelling? Why would the freest, wealthiest people in the world be rebelling? And what he postulates is that they saw what was coming. They knew what was going to happen if they didn't do something. Now, what are we doing? Right? Have we changed our game? Are we still behaving the same way we used to? What the Founding Fathers did is the opposite of what our current governor called for. When all of last year happened, our current governor said, hey, we need more federal money. The Founding Fathers said, we need less British money. We need people to organize in family groups of 10, 50, hundreds, and thousands. We need to get ourselves off the British dole. We need to engage in more home manufacture, spend more time at home, and organize more together in our local communities as parental groups than depending on some idiot to go to the state capitol and do anything good. Because they don't. You know what they do up there? I've been there. They pat each other on the back while a bunch of lobbyists call them the honorable this and representative that and senator this. And they don't want you to know their magic tricks. So when you come talk to them, they'll say, oh, I'm working on it for you. See, I got my bill open. And then they'll go to their friends on the rules committee and they'll say, never let that through. So they can come back to you and say, hey, see, I opened a bill for you. And they'll go, oh, they cared so much about me, they opened a bill. And they won't do jack on it because they've already made deals with somebody else that your bill is dead. How would you know that? You wouldn't. Right? Because how do we vote for people? We like their demeanor. Good hair. Good looking. Talks right. Says the things we want to hear. Do you know why they say the things you want to hear? Because people have spent massive amounts of money to do studies to find out what you should say so you offend no one and accomplish nothing. <laughs> That's how we elect people. That's why Mitt Romney's our senator. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, I played for the right team, but you know, he's a relatively good looking dude with a good looking family. So we vote for him. Right? So unless you change that up, nothing's going to change. So how many of you have started organizing your community? How many of you have groups of 10? How many of you have 50 or 100? How many of you are planning how to make sure none of your elected officials ever get reelected again? You know the type of people you need in office? The ones who always vote no. No, 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 no. But what about public schools? No. <laughs> what about the park? No. Water? <laughs> you see what I mean? How, how do you justify the one and not everything that flows thereafter? Until we get to a mindset like our founding fathers where we rely upon our local communities and we don't want government money anymore, it's just a beast that eats itself. And we leave our posterity with what we got in 2020. It's time for radical reinvention of our ideas. Now, I actually don't believe in rebellion by forms of violence. I will defend myself, right? But I don't think God sanctions doing anything other than turning the other cheek first. And I know we've turned the cheek, okay, many, many times. But have we ever really organized the way we should? When's the last time our communities were really like our caucuses when they were strong, but where we didn't think even Democrat or Republican? We just thought right and wrong. Why don't we go back to that? That's the thing that will save America. And even if we can't save America, that exercise is good. 
and it's good for our communities. It's good for our souls. It's good for our neighbors. It's good for our churches. It's good for our clubs. It's good for our kids. And it's good for our grandkids. Do that, right? A little bit less over there. And for a while, it's going to get worse before it gets better. But the only way to truly make it better is to reinvent the way that God intended people to organize. you got to do it his way. Now, I kind of promised myself I wouldn't get religious with you tonight. But I'm going to close and then let you ask questions with my testimony to you. Okay? That God lives. That he has a son. And that this is his land. So if you want his blessing and you want to save this nation, you've got to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only hope, folks. Okay? Turn to him. And then start helping each other do things right. And that's going to require a whole lot of community-based repenting. All the way back to the day when we knew that schools, even, were the responsibilities of families, not government. Thanks for letting me be here. I will now open it up to you. You can ask anything you want. <laughs> have taken away the right for you to sue unless you have standing and they don't recognize general standing. Uh, there may be some rare exception to that, but generally we the people cannot are. And, and I think one of the philosophies behind that is your area of recourse is through the legislature. Where you defend your right is in the courts and how many of us know how to do that anymore? Right? Most of us don't even know how to defend a speeding ticket. I remember one of the first times I ever went to court. It was in a little city court. And there's a woman sitting next to me. I'm sitting by my client. And you know why she's there? She got a citation for her dog pooping on her neighbor's yard. She was scared to death. She thought she was going to jail. So when the prosecutor came out and said, hey, you can pay us a couple hundred bucks, she was like, oh, hallelujah, thank you so much. She was almost crying. Because she got to give the government money because her dog went to the bathroom in her neighbor's yard. I remember another time I saw a 19-year-old Hispanic kid. He was going to jail for six months for marijuana. Now you may say good for him, but come on. It's legal now. The kid was 19, Hispanic. I mean, how, how severely you want to disable that kid's future? Six months for marijuana? You know what jail's like, guys? It's horrific. It doesn't help anybody. You can put violent offenders there, but I don't know why you put anybody else in jail. It is horrible. It creates criminals. Anyway, I don't know how I got there, but. <laughs> uh, invite me to stand on a stump and I'll jump on it. Yeah. Sounds to me like the real problem is with the judges. There, there is, so there's an important evolution behind that. There is a problem with judges right now. You know where most judges come from? George Soros. <laughs> <laughs> you now have your next stand-up comedy routine. <laughs> um, most judges come from within prosecutors' offices, which didn't exist a long time ago. So most of your judges are being drawn from the very people who are creating all your criminals who think they're always right, who are essentially modern-day Spanish inquisitors hunting down the wicked. All of these folks have received in their emails a... Entitled SCOTUS versus Texas, et al. It proposes a plan for getting the Supreme Court to obey the law. Their no standing order is a flagrant violation of the law. According to the law, you can correct it if you dare. 
but <laughs> uh, the point I want to make here is that we elect those judges locally, right? We can change those judges locally, and we should do that. They should know that if they are not judging on the basis of the rule of law, then we're going to remove them. That's a concept. Yeah. Now I'd like to read to you instruction that we have received. Some of you will recognize this parable. Now unto, you, unto what shall I liken the children of Zion? I will liken them unto the parable of the woman and the unjust judge. Does that sound familiar? <coughs> For men ought always to pray and not to think. So we've got to have courage. We've got to stand up. Which said, there was in the city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. We had that problem. And there was a widow in that city, and, the, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. Well, that's what we're needing to do. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God and regard man, or, or nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. There's strategy. There is strategy. Thus will I liken the children of Zion, let them importune at the feet of the judge. We need to do that continually, and if they will not rule according to law, we change them out. That's amen to your testimony. Um, you know what's interesting about that is I actually brought that concept into the lawsuit last year against the governor. Um, we've lost a lot of Judeo-Christian tradition in the law in America. Now, one of the problems with doing that is if you don't follow the right patterns, you can't get the right results. And sometimes we express those patterns in religious context. And the value of that religious context is that often it comes from thousands of years of wisdom out of different cultures and communities. And so it's really trying to express principles that if you follow them, yield good results. One of those is this concept that how can you ever expect miraculous or divine intervention? And let's take one example, the founding fathers, where they say with a firm reliance upon divine providence, we mutually pledge our lives, fortunes, and sacred honor. Now, what's interesting about that is they're actually invoking the book of Deuteronomy. They're calling upon God's promise that if his people will ever atone themselves or return themselves to him, he will return himself to them. But they have to follow his rules first. And so the founding fathers, they said, hey, look, we see these biblical principles. Let's put them into action. And they do. And by doing that, then they can say, hey, look, we followed the rules of liberty. We gave our lives, our fortune, our sacred honor. Now we expect some divine help here. And so one of the things we wrote into the lawsuit was the concept that we were there to importune to an unjust judge. Not specifically the judge we got, but specifically the government telling them, hey, look, we have done it the right way. And then we brought in John Locke into the lawsuit. And we said, if you're not going to do the right thing, then we will be forced to appeal to heaven. Now, we kind of got mocked for that. But that's the rule. And if you ever want heaven's help, you better do what you're supposed to do. So thank you. I appreciate that. And that is a true principle. No matter what religion you are, that's a true principle. Um, I saw another hand. I won't, we've got basically no time. Let me tell you this. I, I'll answer one more, and then I will stick around. For anybody who wants to stay, I'll even keep this mic going for questions. But please know that we're wrapping up here in four minutes, and you're welcome to go. But I will stick around. Senator Lewis Moore for Liberty under this HB 117 that 
this passed through the state legislature and has gone to the Senate now. And that's the one where employee, employers can demand employees and shoppers be vaccinated. <laughs> yeah. Um, look, here's, here's where the... Uh, Here's where the abandon all hope Morgan's coming out, okay? <laughs> you don't have any liberties left. You've got less liberties now than the founding fathers had when they declared independence. So what you have is a perception of liberty. And, and to be honest, most of you don't even know how to walk into a courtroom and defend those liberties. You have no idea where they came from, you have no idea how to defend them, and you have no idea how to get a bill passed in the legislature. And even if you did, they wouldn't listen to you. So stop fooling yourselves, okay? This is not the time to try and reform how the legislature does business. This is the time to rebuild America from the ground up like the Founding Fathers did. If you don't do that, America is over. It's done. Not only that, if you don't recognize that, you know who you're fighting against? God himself. Because you know who's going to bring America down? God himself. So you get square with him. And you do things the way he says. And then you'll find success. Because you'll do it his way. But if you think you're going to jump up and say, hey, I demand freedom. You got another thing coming. It doesn't work that way, right? You've got little kids in the Philippines working for 10 cents a day and they work for eight hours and they're born with unalienable rights too. You think they're not born with unalienable rights? You think people in China are not born with unalienable rights? God gives them to all mankind. Some people have them. You ought to figure out why some people have them and some people don't and get square with that, but they're gone. Okay, that's why COVID-19 happened. You think that if you have rights, churches would be shut down? Temples closed? Wearing masks at groceries? You don't have rights. They're gone. We've lost them. You need to come to grips with that so that we can save the future. Okay, don't, don't lie to people anymore. That's what I stopped doing. How do you feel about, like, I don't wear a mask in the stores. I don't believe in that she doesn't work. Okay. How do you feel about that? I mean, is it okay for us to do that? Well, are they going to, like, I mean, I know yeah, you I mean, you're, you're going to put yourself at risk so long as you understand the risk. This is one of the interesting things about the bill that I wanted to say that I didn't. Um, if I were to, if, if I were to stop paying state income tax, okay, willfully, I just quit paying it. And the reason I quit paying it is I could not any longer, with the dictates of my conscience, pay for government schools. Okay, to me, they, it represents me uh, doing something wicked. Okay, And so I stop. And the government finds out, and they come to repossess, and they come to take my home. Okay, Should I just let them take my home? But I broke the law. So, but I say to them, hey, stop, you can't take my home. I have an unalienable right to this property. And I also have an unalienable right to my freedom of religion and conscience. And you making me pay for state income tax to go into public schools is against my conscience. How far is that going to get me? And when I resist arrest in the name of my unalienable rights, what are they going to do to me? And then I pull out my gun to defend myself. What do they do? <laughs> and what do all my neighbors say? Well, you shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have exercised my inalienable rights. Now, I'm not going to do that, don't you? <laughs> That's not where I'm going. But you see my point. Once enough of them have the guns, you've got a choice to make. Do you put on the mask? It depends on if you're going to get arrested. Do you care if you get arrested? You're going to care when you're in jail. They're starting to arrest people who show up. We had a guy, Alpine School District got arrested because he was protesting wearing masks at the open public meeting. He's being charged with criminal trespass. I'm defending a kid up in Lehigh who's being charged for holding a party 
during the COVID-19 pandemic because they weren't wearing masks. A 19-year-old kid turning him into a criminal for a mask violation. So just be ready because when the guys with the guns tell you what to do, they're the guys with the guns. Well, the for me, but not for me, like Nancy Pelosi to get checked Yeah, that's why it starts from the ground up. By the way, if you need to go, um, do, does somebody need to come up and wrap things up? Should I, should I go, but I'm, shh. Do what? Am I not? I will, when you finish your sentence. Okay, I finished my sentence. <laughs> hey, thank you so much. Uh, I'll stick around. see the light. So uh, we're going to close right now and, and pick up chairs because we are responsible for this room, but Morgan said he is free to talk and